Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I see some of our colleagues may have had too much tequila last night, uh, but hopefully they'll be joining us soon. Uh, but thank you so much for being here today. We have a very exciting second day to our Solar Summit Mexo conference. And this morning, we're going to shift themes a little bit from the policy and markets discussion of yesterday to looking at broader themes of how to supply and the costs that are involved in supplying the Mexican solar market. So to kick off, my name is MJ Shao. I'm the director of solar research at GTM Research. And I'm going to talk today about what we're seeing for PV system technology and cost trends and what to expect globally and also in Mexico as well. So just to start off, what we've seen over the course of and, and the time that we're in uh, for solar right now has been amazing. Last year we saw globally just under 60 gigawatts of solar installed, and in the next five years, that's going to more than double to 139 gigawatts globally. And a lot of that has been because of the falling price of solar. So the average solar PV system, if you, you know, blend together all the residential rooftop systems, the commercial systems, the utility ground mount systems, is now under $2 a watt. And over that course of the next five years, will fall by 33% to just over $1.20 a watt. Now, of course, remember that's blending in residential systems with utility ground mount systems. But even when we look at systems in isolation in terms of the market segment, we see that in the past year, from 2014 to 2015, system prices have fallen by anywhere between 8 to 15%, depending on the geography. And so the question that we have, of course, is where are solar costs going to go next? Are they going to continue to fall? Will they fall faster than before? Or maybe they'll even rise? So those are some of the questions that we hope to, to answer today for the Mexican solar market. Now, one thing to remember is that you know, when we talk about system prices, it's not just about the dollar per watt. It can't always just be about the dollar per watt. Because you can build a really low priced system that has a really low dollar per watt figure attached, but if it doesn't work, then it's not going to do anything for you. So we really have to think about how do we drive down the cost of solar responsibly and sustainably as well. And that means that we have to factor in the decisions of how we are choosing our financiers and what are their requirements going to be for our PV hardware. And how does our design choices with uh, our PV hardware and manufacturers that we're partnering with affect our ability to install and operate those systems? And of course, all of those together are going to affect what the actual system performance is, which is going to determine how attractive it is for us to invest in those systems. And ultimately, what we want to drive towards is an attractive dollar per kilowatt figure for our end user, as well as good returns for all the parties involved in building out that system. Now, of course, it's really tough to, to look at that without looking, of course, at the different um, component costs that are involved in a PV system. And we want to step through it, again, looking at all these different uh, component costs hardware components as well as soft cost components, and think about how do we have that total systems perspective in terms of driving those costs down. And so we'll talk through a bit about the hardware and looking at how some of these individual balance of system components um, will fall in terms of pricing, but also how we, again, how our choices of which hardware to choose will affect the overall cost stack. We'll look at things like soft costs and how um, you know, the choice of hardware that we have can affect the installation price. Now, we'll talk a little bit about labor pricing in Mexico versus some of the more uh, mature markets out there, and usually labor isn't a, a big factor in systems in Mexico. But I would say that there's also always a hidden cost of, of installation as well, just because your wages aren't necessarily um, high or, or being relative to other markets. Um, there's still a, a cost associated with the quality of insulation as well. And what's great about uh, the Mexican market really starting to take off now is that we have over 250 gigawatts cumulatively installed in the US, or sorry, in the world that uh, the, the market here can really learn from and learn best practices as far as insulating, not repeat the mistakes that um, systems in Germany and systems in Europe and in the US have made throughout the years. Um, 
you know, the, and then we look at the overhead and, mar overhead and margin piece of it, and we see that the, in any growing market, it's going to get more competitive. And so what looks like great margins now may not always stick around. And so we always need to look at how we can complete these projects more efficiently and not just necessarily look at one project at a time, but look at a portfolio of projects and really think about how our choices affect our overall corporate businesses and overhead and margin versus just individual project margins. So to think about that, we want to step through uh, again, individual component costs and what we see happening within those PV hardware costs. We want to look at the total systems and how our hardware choices affect the total system. We want to talk through a little bit of the soft cost considerations that are important for Mexico. And finally, we want to think about, again, that the, the, the project doesn't stop with the installation interconnection. There's still the management of that asset. There's still the operations and maintenance that's involved with PV systems as well. So let's start with PV component cost reductions or what we're seeing. It's really hard to get away from uh, looking at PV systems and not talk about the module itself. The module is the biggest portion of the, the cost stack and you know, it accounts for just under 50% in some cases maybe up to 50% of the PV system. And when you look at the additional hardware BOS, it's only about a, fi a fourth of the project. And then with the soft costs, maybe somewhere around a third of the project. So it's hard to get away from talking about PV modules. But it's important to also keep in mind the context of which PV module prices have gone through over the past 10 to 15 years. We had a long time where PV module prices were quite high, between three and four dollars a watt, and we actually had a period when module prices went up because raw materials were in, uh, were in a shortage situation. That caused the uh, Chinese government, as well as many Chinese manufacturers, to heavily invest in PV module manufacturing, which caused the price of modules to fall significantly by 80% in just a few years. Now that in the past few years, we've seen that the prices of modules have stabilized, you know, still falling from an average of around 70 cents a couple of years ago to now in the mid 60s for some markets and even now in the, in the mid to high 50 cent a watt range for, for global markets. But it's important to keep in mind that when we're at this you know, 55 to 65 to 70 cent level, there's no way we can take a dollar a watt out of the module costs anymore, right? So we have to temper our expectations for which pricing of modules can come down. And in fact, because we see a surge of demand globally, we actually only expect module prices to fall between 15 to 20% in the next five years on average. Now, that doesn't mean that the innovation for PV modules has stopped. In fact, there's still quite a bit of innovation happening. And first of all, costs are, continue, are going to continue to fall. We're still seeing that Chinese manufacturers now are able to, inter to produce modules at an internal cost of about 40 cents a watt. So there's still room for costs to come down. There's still pr ways for prices to come down. However, keep in mind that in the near term, just because they're at 40 cents a watt, because of local considerations, whether it's uh, tariffs or whether it's because of local dem demand constraints or local con supplier constraints, that's ne not necessarily going to be reflected in the actual module price. But the technology is evolving as well. We're seeing a push towards higher efficiency modules as uh, manufacturers go from your typical 15 to 16 percent module to 17 to 19 percent and even 20 percent and above for module efficiency. So and the goal here is to not produce them at, at a higher cost, but to produce them at, at similar costs to what we're seeing now and so that we can really reap the benefits of lower balance of system costs as a result. We're also seeing that module manufacturers are looking to prove the reliability of the modules. You know, for those of us that have been in the industry for a long time, we've always seen this, we've seen this evolution toward this 25-year module warranty, and we've seen the conditions of that warranty change. But really now, uh, mature EPCs and developers are starting to scrutinize those warranties as well and really look beyond just what the legal terms are, but they want to see testing data. They want to see that these modules, at least in laboratory testing or maybe even out in the field, are going to actually perform over 25 years at what the manufacturers have said they would. And finally, we're going to start to see different sorts of form factors involved. 
We've always seen this sort of typical module construction, but we see this push towards things like frameless modules or glass-on-glass -glass modules, or maybe even this push towards integration of other balance of systems like microinverters and DC optimizers for AC modules and smart modules as well. And that's a good segue into where we see this, this shift from, again, keeping in mind that uh, the module has been the significant portion of the costs, uh, but this shift towards looking at other things as far as the balance of systems are concerned. And so if we take an extreme example and look just maybe like seven or eight years ago in the U.S. residential market, we see, again, modules were about 40% of costs. But because the module price has fallen so quickly, but other balance of system costs haven't fallen so quickly, if we look again at our neighbors to the north um, and we see what, uh, what the cost stack looked like last year, the module is just one-fifth of the overall cost of the system. And so there's huge opportunities with the, to reduce still the balance of system. Now let's take maybe a more applicable, um, applicable uh, uh, situation where we're looking at maybe ground mount prices where the modules used to be over 60% of the, or used to be over 50% of the price, and now again are in that 40% of the total system. So again, there needs to be the shift from the module to thinking about balance of system costs and how can we reduce them as well. And one thing that people always look to and say, oh, well, the module pricing has fallen quickly, so why not look at the inverter pricing now? Well, one thing to say is that inverter pricing has come down quite a bit as well. It's fallen by 33% to 50% um, over the past five years. And while there's still room for that to continue to come down, you know, when you're talking about a 10 cent a watt or, or you know, even less than that for a utility central inverter, you know, pulling out 20% of that is only gonna net you uh, one or two cents a watt. It's, it's, you know, it's important, but it's not gonna necessarily make or break your project. So again, you have to think about um, the, the limits to which we can continue to just keep pushing component prices down. That being said, similar to modules, we're still seeing a lot of innovation in inverters as well. We see, for example, this trend towards decentralization, where things like three-phase string inverters have really taken off in the market. In fact, we, in fact, over all systems installed globally between 20 kilowatts and five megawatts, two-thirds of them are using uh, decentralized technologies, are using string inverters rather than utility central inverters. And we see similar concepts happening in the residential rooftop space where, for example, again, in our neighbors to the north in the U.S., over 55% of residential systems are now being installed with either microinverters or DC optimizers. We also see this push, you know, maybe a little bit counter, but, but still related to the, the trend above towards pushing towards higher power classes for inverters as well. Taking that same package and really innovating on the power semiconductors and the, and the, the, the motors, like not the actual motors, but the power semiconductors within that inverter, making them more efficient, relying on innovations from the semiconductor industry, and being able to, in just a slightly larger package, go from a 30 kilowatt inverter to a 60 kilowatt string inverter. And suddenly, you know, where, you're, where we used to see just you know, 30 kilowatt string inverters and five megawatt uh, ground mount systems, we can see 60 kilowatt inverters in 10 or 20, and sometimes, you know, for example, uh, in China, we've seen string inverters being used on 100 megawatt systems, for example. So, and that's not just related to string inverters, we're also seeing that in central inverters, too, where you're seeing, you know, you used to see a standard 500 kilowatt or one megawatt inverter, starting to see in that same footprint, uh, going from one megawatt to two megawatts, and being able to re significantly reduce your electrical balance of system materials uh, through, the, through that, that um, increase in power. And finally, the inverters are getting smarter, they're getting better, and they have more features as well. We see monitoring, for example, being integrated into the inverter, and not just uh, hardwired monitoring, but wireless monitoring. You know, there's a point where now a lot of string inverters don't even have an LCD screen because it's assumed that you're just going to have your smartphone and carry around with it and be able to connect wireless with, wirelessly with that inverter. We're starting to see grid integration being more important. Yesterday we heard about how there's going to be some issues involving, uh, you know, things like 
with things like fault right through or reactive power support that's needed for large systems and that there might be some transmission or distribution constraints as we continue to build out more intermittent solar. So the inverters are getting smarter as far as controlling the output and being able to deal with reactive power uh, for the system as well. And we'll continue to see that evolve into where we can start to see inverters be aggregated and really controlled as, a, as an entire unit or through a portfolio rather than just individually or just individually on site. Similarly, we see same themes happening in structural balance of systems and the racking materials. Prices have fallen towards commodity levels. In fact, when you look at the cost stack for residential rail base or a ground mount fixed tilt system, you see that the, um, you see that the cost of the raw materials is actually quite significant. Um, and so there's a limit to which we can continue to push, push down structural balance of system costs. You know, if the cost of steel, you know, is, 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 you know, accounts for six cents a watt in a fixed tilt ground mount system, well, unfortunately, we as a solar industry aren't large enough to be able to drive the volumes that are going to, you know, push down steel prices, right? So we're kind of beholden to a limit to which we can, we can continue to drive down structural balance of systems. So it's about being more intelligent, again, going from this, this commodified uh, structural balance of system and thinking about how we can leverage that, that uh, piece of the, the balance of systems to do more for us. So that's why we've seen this huge push towards tracking. You know, a lot of, you know, early on in PV's growth, uh, a lot of people fell away from tracking because it was simply more expensive. They felt like they were paying a premium and they wanted to drive towards the lowest, you know, dollar per watt. Well, yes, you're going to pay extra for a tracking system, but right now those prices have fallen so that they're only about a 5 to 10% premium over fixed tilt. But especially in high insulation areas like Mexico, you can defer, deliver you know, 25 to 30% or perhaps even more energy. And so your ultimately, ultimate dollar per kilowatt hour is going to fall significantly. And the other exciting thing about trackers, too, is that they're still in that middle of the growth period. There's not much innovation that's left for a structural fixed tilt system, right? You know, it's just a bunch of metal pieces that you're putting together. But with the tracker, there's still the motors, the controls, um, the, and how that system is integrated together that still can be innovated on, and as a result, drive down the, the price of tracking as well. One of the things we also see is this push towards using the space that we have more efficiently. So either going towards east-west systems on rooftops or just simply raising the ground coverage ratio and realizing that you know, there's going to be a little bit of shade, but ultimately you're going to be able to drive more power per space. And if things like land costs, if things like your operating costs and your, your soft costs and your overhead and margin are the big pieces of your cost stack and it's not the hardware, well, then you're ultimately going to save on your overall system costs by, by focusing on pushing more power in that limited space that you have. And finally, we start to think of things like uh, railless, for example, on rooftop and what we see in terms of removing a lot of the, the materials that are involved in installing systems. So uh, rather than, in, for example, in residential rooftop systems, rather than having a long extruded aluminum rail, relying on the modules frame to be that structural element, and as a result, reduce the materials that you need on site, but also the log logistics, the shipping, and then the installer air and the installer um, effort on the roof. They no longer have to cut rails. They can shift things around more easily on the roof, and you can ultimately have a more efficient process that way. Now, we've talked about what's happening within these individual components, but again, we want to think about the total system package. And for this section, I really want to focus on two things that we're starting to see that are going to become really hot in 2016. Two, one trend in utility scale solar, one trend in distributed generation solar that we think is going to start to really, uh, put, really change and, and lower costs and change the way that we look at systems. And one is pretty simple. It's not necessarily revolutionary, but it's this push towards higher DC voltages on ground mount systems. And so when you go from our traditional 1,000 volt DC systems to 1,500 volt DC systems, we start to see anywhere between a 3 to 5% reduction in total system cost. And that's really big these days, especially when we're dealing at, with EPC prices around uh, you know, $1 to $1.30 a watt, depending where you are. 
And you're going to have, one of the things is you're going to have to pay slightly more for the individual components. Your, for example, combiner boxes might cost you 20% to 40% or maybe even more. Your inverters might cost you sometimes a, a cent or two cents a watt more. Um, but ultimately, you're going to need less materials, less wires, less combiner boxes, less DC protection. And that's where you're going to start to see the savings on the overall system cost. Now, one of the biggest barriers in the past to 1,500 volts has been the ecosystem. You know, you, it's great. You, you can put 1,500 volts on you know, a piece of paper or a design drawing, but if you don't have materials, that's a problem, right? But we're starting to see that ecosystem grow, to which we see over, uh, over 10 module manufacturers that now have certification for 1,500 volt, a growing number of inverter companies that are providing 1,500 volt, uh, uh, inverters, as well as all the electrical balance of systems materials between. So at this point, um, we really see the, the 1500 volt landscape flourishing. This year in 2016, we'll see about four and a half gigawatts of 1500 volt DC systems installed, and that's going to grow to over 95% of utility scale systems by the year 2020. On the distributed generation side, we see that there's a more intelligent integration <laughs> of PV components. So it's not just providing a PV module with a bunch of inverters, but it's really intelligent in thinking about how these things connect. And so we can start to think of things like AC modules or smart, uh, smart modules where you actually have the inverter, microinverter or DC optimizer replacing the junction box on the back of the module. And that, again, makes the, or you can start to think about how racking um, gets connected to the string inverters on the rooftop, or even in some commercial ground mount systems, how your tracking solutions, electrical balance of systems, and your inverter all fit together. And again, once you think about uh, what uh, the system costs are, you know, hardware is, yeah, it's, it's almost 50% of a cost stack for, again, for in this case, a Mexico residential system, but there's all this other activity you're doing, whether it's you know, the overhead of shipping and logistics, whether uh, it's engineer, engineering the system, that you can ultimately save on because you're not trying to piecemeal all these module, uh, modules and inverters together. You're not trying spending all your time you know, trying to find the best pressing for everything. You know all these parts are going to work together. Uh, you're standardizing on it. You can move job to job efficiently because, again, you have this standard package that you already know is going to work and you already know how to take care of. And that pushes us to some soft cost considerations. And I think one of the biggest soft costs, you know, again, when we look at, for example, in, in our uh, home country of the US, labor typically becomes one of the, the, the toughest soft cost components to really talk about. And in Mexico, that's, that's not really an issue, right? You, you're, the average wages here are significantly less. And so we start to think, oh, well, the soft cost shouldn't maybe be that important. However, just because, just because we see, just because things like wages are here are a little are less than they are in, in you know other in other developed countries, that doesn't mean that there aren't soft costs involved in the system. And so if we you know look at things like the module, they're about the same between Mexico and the U.S. The inverters are a little bit pricier on average in the U.S. simply because we have a lot of more microinverter penetration, for example. Um, we, the hardware BOS in the U.S. is a lot higher because we have a lot of safety and electrical code requirements that you don't necessarily have to deal with here. Um, and then labor is the big piece. And so you can sit, think, oh, well, the, the price of, of systems in Mexico should be a lot smaller, right? And they are. They are. In fact, they're about 2.30 a watt we see on average, maybe even less trending towards $2 a watt versus $3.5 per watt. But what's interesting about both of these is that the soft costs involved, all that other activity involving engineering, distribution, shipping, um, warehousing, um, you know, even that overhead and margin piece, uh, customer acquisition, is still about 50% of each of these systems. And so there's still a lot of activity we can think about when we're looking at lowering the soft costs of a Mexico PV system. And so some of the things we should consider and, and we, we must consider here are things like high cost of capital. You know, this doesn't necessarily fit completely in the cost stack, but it is a, a soft cost that we have to deal with. There's a cost associated with having to chase you know, financing and having that finance be, be a high, you know, come at a high interest rate or a high uh, return requirement. We've talked a little bit about this yesterday, but the exchange rate, if you're paying for 
modules, inverters, and, and all your balance of systems in dollars, and the peso is uh, devaluing, that's a big, that has a big effect on you know, what prices can, how far prices can ultimately fall. And so does that mean, you know, that, that's a bit of a challenge. Does that mean you rely on more local hardware? Does that mean, mean you have to hedge a little bit more? So there's some interesting challenges there as far as soft costs. You know, looking at distribution versus direct purchasing. You know, the, the ecosystem here, um, especially for the residential small commercial side, is that, you know, there, there are, yes, there are a few larger um, installers, but many installers are quite small. And so, you know, as they scale, they're going to have to look at this challenge of, do I continue to rely on distribution? You know, what, is the, what are the benefits and values distribution is adding to me? Or do I necessarily, once I hit scale, choose to go direct? And there's, there's some hidden costs associated with warehousing and with, with making those relationships that uh, need to be considered as well. One thing is, you know, early on, and for example, again, in the U.S. market, we thought that, oh, as everybody learns about solar energy, getting new customers is going to be easy. Everyone's going to know about it. They're going to come to us, right? What we've actually found is that customer acquisition costs haven't fallen. And in fact, in some cases, they're actually growing. And it's because at the beginning of any market, you get a lot of people who are really excited about solar energy. And you get, uh, for example, in the Mexico residential sector, you're going to get a lot of the, those DAC customers that, um, that immediately see a payoff in going with solar. But as you just grow the industry, as you scale the industry, and you move past those early adopters to the mainstream customer, there are a lot of challenges in convincing them um, what, the mar you know, what solar energy is to begin with and what sort of economic benefit is there, and can you actually give them an attractive benefit. And so there's, there's still a lot more work to be done. And so customer acquisition, uh, you want to have a good process in place now because it doesn't necessarily get easier. It doesn't necessarily get cheaper. One of the things to think about, again, we talked a little bit about differences in labor. And then again, labor, installation labor here is relatively cheap. But one of the things you want to think about is how even though you don't necessarily need to save a lot of time on the roof, um, you do want to think about how that time is utilized and how your installers are putting that system on the roof to ensure that you have high quality of a system. Because what that's ultimately going to lead to is that, is that there's a cost that's associated with asset management and operations and maintenance, right? Especially if you have deal with a cash system, certainly you've got all that cash up front, you've made your margin. But if you have to support that customer by going out and fixing that uh, system you know, one time a month or even one time a year, that's going to eat away at those margins that you make, and you won't be able to recover them except through you know, other sales. And so that brings us to kind of the final topic of asset management, operations, and maintenance, which, again, in an early market, a lot of people think, like, oh, solar is easy. Solar doesn't need a lot of maintenance. Well, what we actually found is that's not true. There's actually a lot of problems that can happen. Um, modules, you know, it's usually typical to, to see a lot of scary pictures about modules. But, you know, in the bottom two pictures, those aren't module problems. Those were uh, on the, uh, the left-hand side, that's a corroded wire because someone didn't properly uh, use the right connectors. And then on the right, that was a fire that was started because of a ground fault in an inverter. And so there, there are problems. They're not necessarily always this obvious. And that's the other thing, is that there can be hidden problems that start to creep up that happen during the installation, but don't necessarily manifest until three to five or even longer down the road. Um, so there is a cost that is associated with uh, dealing with operations and maintenance. And a lot of times that's built into these larger projects. But one of the things to think about, especially if you're in the distributed generation sector, is that it can be even harder to deal with these problems when you're, or when you're, when you're again, in distributed generation. Um, a lot of folks see things as common as, in fact, the most common problem in these systems is dealing with the wireless connection or the wired connection on the monitoring system, for example. You're monitoring the system, and suddenly you see no PV system production. And it's not because the system has done anything wrong. It's because the monitoring has gone out because someone decided that they wanted to connect you know, something else to that router or, or you know, someone accidentally pulled that plug. Um, so these are connect and these are tough problems to troubleshoot, and they're tougher problems to solve because it's not a big system. 
and it might be you have a lot of different DG systems in very different parts of the region that you're operating in, and it can be tough to send someone out immediately, and the payoff ne isn't always necessarily that great for it. So one of the things, again, that we really heavily want to emphasize is that, you know, again, looking at these issues, they're not necessarily that hardware has failed, but it's a lot of times the installation itself. And so the better, the more you can drive up the quality of that installation, the less problems hopefully you'll have down the road. And so that just kind of brings me to some concluding thoughts here. You know, um, over the next five years, we still see that there's a lot of promise in when you take into account all these trends, all these technology innovations, the falling costs of solar. And in any given region, we see anywhere between 15 to 30 percent cost reductions. Um, and the question is from here, you know, where does Mexico really go? Oh, but I would encourage you to, again, think of things beyond just the upfront cost. We really have to consider, you know, how do we develop a good financing ecosystem here to reduce the cost of capital? We have to think about how system performance plays into all of this. We have to think about the long-term operations and maintenance that it is a cost of the solar, but it's not reflected in the dollar per watt cost that we're purchasing the system at. And finally, thinking about how we can leverage solar eventually to do other things, maybe packaging with storage, maybe packaging with energy efficiency or home energy management, and so that solar is delivering more value than just the kilowatt hours it's generating. And ultimately, again, drive it to a very attractive dollar per kilowatt hour, as well as a return for all the parties involved. So I'll just end on the fact that you know, we're in 2015 right now. Mexico's solar industry is just getting started. If we look at the cumulative amount of installations, it's still just under a gigawatt. And you know, there's a lot of challenges in the near term, but you know, as an industry, if we can solve them, if we can work through them, we see that total solar installations in Mexico can exceed seven gigawatts by 2020, and that's 20 times more solar that's installed today. So if you think the solar industry here is exciting now, Think about just five years from now how crazy and how complex and how amazing it's going to be to be in this industry. And so it's important for us to get all the things right right now so that when, as the industry scales up, we make sure that we're being efficient. We're making sure that we can deliver the lowest cost of energy that we can and really, again, make solar energy successful in Mexico. So with that, thank you. And then we're going to move immediately on to the next session, which is going to be talking about some of these elements, but within experts in the field. So if I can have my panelists come onto this stage, that would be great. Thank you.